All right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see everybody. And uh, I noticed on the announcements that I did say every Wednesday morning we have men's Bible study, but uh, it's most Wednesday mornings. So not every. Um, we will be having it this Wednesday, but not the following Wednesday. Then I don't know where we'll be at. So I've been doing some work overnights and stuff, and so uh, that's what kind of takes me out of that every now and then. Um, Steve, would you turn me down just there? And let me know if you can still hear me in the back or not. We'll make adjustments as we go. But um, this morning, I wanted to talk to everybody about biblical responsibility and kind of where that derived from is, is a lot of what's going on in the world today and the perception that people have of what we as Christians should or shouldn't do, what we can and can't do. Um, and I know that there's a lot of, of pastors, a lot of teachers and stuff preaching on this these days, or a lot more anyway, than what used to, because it seemed like we almost went through like a season where pastors didn't want to hit on anything that might be controversial. Um, I assure you, though, we will hit on things that are controversial because we're supposed to. Um, and I, I also just wanted to encourage you guys to uh, to really pray for your pastors, your church leadership. Um, and ultimately, all of you are also church leadership. I'll break that down a little bit more as we go throughout the, uh, this message this morning. But really, all of us truly are. And so as I was praying for uh, this message and, and what I felt like God was wanting to share, there was, there was just so many things that were, that were coming up in me, you know, and so many things that I've been um, wrestling with as far as like all these, these pastors and stuff that are, are leaving the ministry or they're, they're falling uh, morally and, and all this stuff. And it, it's just been devastating, you know, it really has been devastating. And so I encourage you guys to please pray for us, for any of us to think that we are not susceptible to that is just ridiculous. For anybody, whether it's a, a, a you know, a pastor or uh, somebody that's high up in ministry and evangelism, whatever it is, everyone is susceptible. And so I, I just really ask you guys to uh, to pray for us. And as I was putting this, this message together, one of the things that that was kind of stuck in my mind was the fact that uh, you all remember the the uh, the verse that in Matthew seven one through five it, it talks about um, the hypocrite who has the log or the plank in their own eye and trying to get a speck out of their brother's eye you know and it it, it starts out talking about don't judge other people because then to that same measure that you're judging them, you will also be judged. And I think that probably all of us, at some point in time, look at, at different people and their actions and their lifestyle or whatever, and we start to make our own judgment calls on them, you know? Even if we know them or don't know them or whatever, we start to formulate our own judgment. But then I, I was starting to think about that so much, and, and has anybody in here ever got a speck in their own eye? A speck, yeah, straight up. Like it is something so tiny, but it takes all of your attention. You can't do anything else. You're like, oh, and it's it's teeny tiny. You're even looking in the mirror, crying your eye open, trying to figure out where this thing is. I go to my wife. I'm like, do you see it? She's like, I don't see anything. I'm like, it's in there. I feel it. It's like digging my eyeball out. Like, but and that's just a little speck. It takes everything, all of your attention. And it's just a little speck. And Jesus tells us 
to consider the fact of the things that are going on in our lives. The issues that I have in my life before I, I even think about trying to take out the, the speck in your eye. Have you ever seen anybody with something bigger stuck in their eye than a speck? It's rough. Like, I hate seeing any, anything that has to do with an eyeball. You know, it's like, oh. it just gives me the EGs. You know, like the lip. When I was in, when I was in school, um, a kid in my brother's class, his dad was out mowing the lawn, and he hit a, a little wire, and it flew up and stuck in my, my buddy's eyeball. And he lost his eye. You know, he had this glass eye, and so he, he would go around school like popping his eye out and stuff. <laughs> Super cool. Um, but not getting not getting a wire stuck in your eyeball, but the fact that you could do that, I thought it was pretty neat. But, um, but man, whenever we take these Jesus' teachings and we really start to try to break them down and, and contextualize them for our own lives, he he really helps to, to bring us out on an even playing field, you know, and he helps us to, to focus on the issues that are going on in our own lives. I'm not saying that we shouldn't help other people with their struggles, you know, with, with the things that they're going through. We absolutely should. But whenever we're struggling with something that much bigger and we are, we're more focused on these people and their issues, and we're trying to fix that instead of going humbly to the throne room of, of God and having him heal us, fix us, take the plank out of our own eyes. You know what I mean? Like, it, it's simply a distraction is what it is. Things, things have to be done in a right order. And that is part of that right order, is, is asking God to heal you, forgive you, redeem you, restore you. You know, all those things, and to give your you a pure heart, you know, purify my heart. And help us clean our own lives up first. And I'm not saying that, that you have to be perfect before you can help people. That's absolutely not what I'm saying in any way, shape, or form. But I think a lot of times as church leadership, uh, and I'm not talking about this church leadership in particular, I'm talking about the church as a whole, and we certainly don't have it together. Please don't think that I'm saying we have it together, but all these other churches, that's not what I'm saying. But as churches and church leadership as a whole, it seems like a lot of times they try to make it look like they have nothing wrong in their lives. Like they, they've got it all right, you know, and they never show any kind of uh, vulnerability. They never show any kind of... of um, susceptibility to uh, weakness or sin or anything. And, you know, we're all just people. But I'm looking at the the state of our nation, the state of our country, and it is rapidly, rapidly declining. And we know that it's going to, right? I mean, we know that the Word tells us that things are going to get even considerably worse than they are right now, but man, we don't want to, you know? And, and God tells us that there will, will be a third great way, that there will be a great fall. It says that there will be a great falling away too, but there is going to be change. There can be change. Second Chronicles seven fourteen is where it says, if my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. Amen. Man, there's, but there's, there's a process that we've got to follow. We just want him to do it without us changing. We just want him to do it without us taking the steps that he tells us to take. It's like, well, God, I'm too busy. I've got too much going on. How am I supposed to Humble myself, like, why? And why would I even humble myself? You know, I've been, I've been saved. I've been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. I don't need to humble myself. Yes, we all need to humble ourselves. And that's the first step. I don't think that it, it's a coincidence that that's the first thing that's listed. Because if we're not humble, 
then we're not going to do any of the rest of the things because we won't believe that we need to pray. We won't believe that we need to seek his face. And he doesn't just say pray. He doesn't just say seek my face. He says pray and seek my face. But then it's not just that, you know. Do you notice the order that he puts this in? He says, humble yourself, pray, seek my face. And then he says, and turn from your wicked ways. So many people feel like that because they have wicked ways that they can't pray, that they can't seek his face. And that's a straight up lie from the enemy. It's a lie from the pit of hell. He's the one that can cleanse you. He's the one that can redeem you and restore you. So you do have to turn to him before you can really ultimately turn from your wicked ways. Because you have to have his help to do that. Believe me, I've tried for years and years and years and years and years to turn from my wicked ways on my own. And I wasn't able to do it without him. But I love how he says, then I will hear from heaven. Isn't it interesting that he says, I'll hear from heaven? He doesn't say, I'll hear you. But he does hear us. I mean, don't get me wrong, but he says, I will hear from heaven. And that's because our prayers, you know, I love this. I love that our prayers are like an incense that rises up to heaven and is mixed together in the bowl. And it's, it rises up like a sweet aroma and an incense to the Lord. And then he casts the answer back down to us. So I, I kind of, in my mind's eye, I picture that he's, that's what he's talking about whenever he says, I hear from heaven and I will heal you. I'll forgive their sins, and I will heal their life. That's huge. But that has, has really just been weighing on my heart, and I certainly hope that it weighs on your guys' hearts too. I have prayed time and time again, and I, I continue to find myself praying, Lord, break my heart for what breaks yours. <laughs> and I know that that's a great song, um, but I do think that it's extremely biblical. I do think that he wants us to have his heart, and his heart, I guarantee you, breaks whenever he sees the, the state of the world that we live in. He rejoices whenever he sees those of us that are his and that are uh, called by his name, that he loves, that he's made in his image and in his likeness. But man, the, he's made everybody, and he wants all of us to come to him. So I know that it breaks his heart to see what's going on in the world today. Our biblical responsibilities, there's quite a few, really, if you want to get all the way down into the weeds. I'm going to go over a few of them today that have kind of been pressed on my heart. But I do feel like that there's some things that we have to do, some things that we have to have in our lives in order to be able to successfully accomplish the biblical responsibilities that God has called us to. Um, and there's two really huge ones, really huge ones. And Jesus even calls them the greatest two commandments, is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the greatest one. And I'm, I'm standing here to tell you today, you can't, Follow your biblical responsibilities without that. Because without loving the Lord your God with everything, putting Him first and foremost, and truly loving Him, then you won't see the importance of doing all the other things. It's not going to be important to you whatsoever. And if you're not loving Him, then you're going to love yourself. You're going to love money. You're going to love the things of the world. And so it's really going to be kind of impossible. The second one is to love others. And he says, the second greatest commandment is just like the first one, is to love your neighbor as yourself, to love others as yourself. Matthew 22, 37 through 40, I strongly recommend that you read all of that. But at the very end of it, he's telling us the greatest commandment is this, to love the Lord. You know, he's laying all that out, but then the very last part of it, he says, all the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. Everything that the law says, everything that the law requires, everything that the prophets foretold, everything that they said about God, 
hinges on these two things. Every bit of it. So without these, you can't please God. You can't honor God. You can't do the things that He's called you to do without those two things. You know, the Word tells us to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and then all these things will be added to you. But He says, seek first these things. I find myself a lot of times seeking first my provision or my own happiness or whatever. I mean, you can fill it in with just about anything. Why is it that we, we get so distracted so easily, so quickly, and we aren't seeking the kingdom of God first? You know, Jesus, whenever he ministered so much, he would say, the kingdom of God is like this. The kingdom of God is like this. It's like this. And he's just laying out so many things. And it's, it's big and it's bold and it's amazing. But he's saying, seek first the kingdom of God and ultimately to love God and to love others. If you truly love him, the rest of everything else will fall. It will fall. It has to fall. And I've experienced that in my own life. Have you guys ever experienced something where you were struggling with something so hard that you just thought there's no possible way that I'm ever going to be able to overcome this struggle, this temptation, this trial, whatever it is. And then you've tried and tried and tried and tried, and you just couldn't do it in your own power, your own strength. And then, you know, whenever it comes down to the very end, you're like, well, I've got nothing else that I can possibly do except seek God. And then you seek Him, and He's like, oh, it's about time. Here you go. You're like, what? <laughs> That's so easy. It's the easy button. Right? And he, he, he does make things like that so easy for us. So our, our biblical responsibilities, let's jump back into that. There are so many things that we are required to do. And I just, this one thing was kind of just glaring out at me. And it's in Matthew 23, 23. And Jesus, he's talking to the uh, Pharisees, the, the religious leaders. He says, what sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees? <clears throat> what sorrow awaits? These are the people that are the most qualified to teach the word of God, to lead the people. But he says, what sorrow awaits you? He says, for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income of your herb garden. But you ignore the more important aspects of the law. He goes on and says that those are justice, mercy, and faith. Then it says, you should tithe. Yes, you should. But do not neglect the more important things. He's not saying don't do these things. And this could be applied to so many other things. It could really be applied to pretty much anything in the law. Yes, you should do these things, but don't neglect these more important things. Justice, mercy, and faith. So justice is the quality of being fair and reasonable. It doesn't seem like a lot of the things going on in our world today, especially in our country, in our judicial system, are fair and reasonable. This is just something that I've recognized. You know, things that are bad are called good, and things that are good are called bad. It just doesn't make any sense. Things aren't making sense. But God says that one of the more important things is justice. We have to stand up for justice. We have to. And sometimes that means telling people that have a different opinion what the truth is. Mercy. Mercy is another thing, and it's, that is compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone whom it is within one's power to punish or harm. So they've done something wrong. They've hurt you. They've wronged you. Whatever it is, they've done something wrong, and it's in your power to punish them. It's in your power to harm them. But God is a God of mercy as well. And that kind of... it. It almost makes it sound like it contradicts justice, but it doesn't. God is a just God, but he's also a merciful God. And then faith. 
Faith is so deep, and we could go on and on about faith, but faith is the complete trust or confidence in someone or something. And what Jesus was talking about in particular was faith in him, faith in the Father, faith in our relationship with him, in how he communicates with us, faith with, within how we communicate with him. These things are extremely important. Is it, is it just me or, or do you guys ever think about um, the fact that some people try to wrap all of the things that we should do into the same equal playing field? And what I mean by that is, is we think that every single aspect of our relationship with God or uh, our faith in Christ, Christianity, our religion, the law, whatever it is, that, that everything is on this exact same playing field. That it all has the same value. I've felt like that before. I've thought that before. But this clearly tells us that that's simply not the case. There are important things to do. And Jesus says, yes, you should do these important things. But the most important things are loving me, loving others, justice, mercy, faith. There are things that are more important. Don't neglect these, but put more emphasis on this. Make this more so part of your life, and these other things will naturally flow out. James 1, 27 says, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. If you've ever wondered what it is that God really wants you to do, he's laying it out right here. This is religion that God the Father accepts as pure and faultless. To look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Mm. That's religion that the Father accepts. He doesn't say to make a big show out of things. He doesn't say that our presentation has to be perfect. He doesn't say that in order for me to be in perfect right standing with him, I have to get up here and have all this lined out exactly perfect, and our lights have to be great, and sound has to be just right, and all this stuff. He doesn't even mention it at all in this, in this aspect. Not that we aren't supposed to do things in excellence, because we are supposed to do things in excellence. I'm not saying perfect, I'm saying excellent. Only God is perfect, but we are supposed to do things in excellence. But this, this is what touches the heart of God, is whenever we do help the widows and the orphans in their distress. Don't you think that it would be um, stressful to lose your significant other or to lose your parents? How stressful, big time. You're in a place of distress. And God calls the rest of us, the body of Christ, to care for these people. To care for them. No matter who you are. Even if you are one of them. He's calling all of us to do that. He's saying this is so, so incredibly important to me. And to keep ourselves from being polluted by the world. How can we keep ourselves from being polluted by the world? We live in the world. But he tells us to be in the world, but not of the world. He says that we're sojourners and strangers, aliens, passing through. Because we are just passing through. And we don't have to allow everything to corrupt us. But so many people, if, if there's going to be a great falling away, that that, then that means that there were people in relationship with God. But they got corrupted by the world. And put it into a perspective of, of a parent. Right? You have your kids. You love your kids so much. You want relationship with your kids. But then maybe they, they start dating somebody that is not good for them. Right? They start getting into this relationship with the, the wrong crowd. They're, they're following the wrong group of people. And then that wrong group of people or that person says, don't, I don't want you hanging out with your family. 
They're, they're not like us. And so they start pulling them away and making them uh, estranged from the family. Wouldn't that Wouldn't that destroy your heart? And that's why God tells us this. He says, don't be polluted by the world because it's going to cause separation. It's going to pull you away from it. And that's super, super important to him, obviously. But whenever we're just reading this as, as us with God and we aren't taking it into, into um, we're not contextualizing it to where, like, what it would do to us and making, if he's a good, good father, it says he's our heavenly father, he's our father. It's because we're his children and he loves us like his children. And if we're his children, then we can, we can start to understand a little bit more about him if we start putting things into, into context of with our own children. And if he's so passionate about us helping the, the widows and the orphans, helping the helpless, we need to make that a priority. I'll put a verse, um, some verses in here, Matthew 25, 35 um, through 40. I wasn't going to read all the way through, but I think I Jesus is talking and he says, For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothes. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. He says, Then these righteous ones will reply. Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink or a stranger and show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? This was just like, they're not, I'm like, what are you talking about? When did, when did we do this? But he says, the righteous ones are going to ask these things. And he says, and the king will say, I tell you the truth. You can believe me. You can, you can take this to the bank. I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. <coughs> hmm. So you mean if, if we're helping these people, if we're doing things for people that, that really need help and we're, we're caring for them and loving for them, this is, you view that as us doing that to you? He says, yes, exactly. I view it as you doing that to me. And you're going to reap the reward for doing that to me. If you continue to read on, I'm not going to. But my point is, he views the good things that we do for his people as doing it to him. Well, if he views the good things that we do for his people as we're doing it for him, what does he view the bad things that we're doing to his people or not doing for his people? Well, doesn't the same have to apply? Doesn't it have to mean the same thing whenever we're not taking care of people, whenever we're not affecting our area of influence? And I'm not saying going out and, and helping the whole world. You can't, but you can help. Who God's put in your path to help. You can affect your area of influence. Because he's put you right there where you are for a specific purpose. He says I've got a plan for you. He knows that he has a plan for us. And sometimes that plan means that he's going to literally put you where you are the only one that can help these people. And by doing so is helping you. And by not doing so is not helping you. Listen, I'm not trying to bring conviction on you. If any of you are like, oh man, this is so heavy, and you're, and, and you're feeling like, you know, I'm attacking, I'm not attacking. I'm just saying we have a biblical responsibility, and this is part of it. Matthew 
No one is more helpless than the unborn or a newborn. Nobody. And there might be people that, that say, hey, are you seriously going to start talking about this abortion issue? Isn't this a separation of church and state? No, it's not. It's absolutely not. This is a moral issue. But even if it were an issue of separation of church and state, I would do it anyway. I would say it anyway, because it needs to be said. And I know that probably most, if not all of you, land on the same um, moral compass that I do whenever it comes to this. But if God's talking about all of his, his children and he's constantly making reference to his children and helping the helpless and helping those that can't help themselves and orphans and all that stuff, doesn't it, doesn't it lead us to believe that he's extremely passionate about children? And these ridiculous claims that a child that's still inside a mother's womb is not a child is some of the most appropriately from the pulpit. <laughs> um, that's just absolutely ridiculous nonsense. Whenever uh, a mother can have a premature baby, way, way, way premature, and it's still lit, and it's still developed, and it's still breathing, and it's still turn out to have, you know, life, then it is life. It is a person. Not only is it just a life and just a person, it's a person that's created in the image and in the likeness of God, and God himself is the one that thought of that person and wanted that person. And created that person and fashioned that person in that mother's womb. He loves the little children. He loves them very much so. And we absolutely must fight for them. And even if us fighting for them, even us speaking up for the rights of the unborn, even us speaking up for the rights of the mothers that are that are being pressured into abortions, because that happens a lot in the end. We, uh, we just did the Shadow uh, Center's um, banquet um, for life. What was the actual name of that? Fundraising banquet. Yeah, it was a fundraising banquet, but it's it's for life. And the, the keynote speaker there was Melissa Oden, and she was actually, uh, her mother, her birth mother, was forced into, abort, uh, into aborting that, that child, into aborting her. And the attempt failed. And uh, it's quite a story. You really, 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 I, I strongly encourage you to look into that. But what we, what we found is that even, even the people in the church sometimes are encouraging and, and sometimes forcing people to get abortions that they don't want to even get. And that's really sad, you know. It's super sad. Thank you, God, that you're a God of forgiveness, and you're a God of mercy, and you're a God of new beginnings. I will tell you, whenever I was thinking about that situation, whenever Melissa was telling the story, and I started thinking about all of these kids that had been aborted. It really is. It's, it's horrible. And we, we talk about those babies a lot, right? But those, those mothers and even the fathers still have to live on with that. And these babies, though, I fully believe that when they die, their life is taken from them, that they go to be with the Lord. Fully believe that. Because they're innocent. Right? And so, as sad as it is, as much as I feel, you know, mournful and sad for them, um, they're not in a place of, 
of pain anymore. Their pain was generally pretty, pretty short-lived. But God also wants us to remember that even whenever our kids stumble, even whenever they make mistakes, even whenever they do things that, that they know that we've told them not to do and they do it anyway, that they're still our kids, that they can still come to us, they can still repent, they can still be forgiven, redeemed, they can. And that's extremely important for us to remember. You know, it's easy to get really angry with, uh, with people, even the people doing the abortions. And believe me, um, if I went into my flesh, a lot more of those people wouldn't exist anymore. But um, I can't do that. And I don't think we should because I think that that would also hurt the father's heart. You know? In Matthew 18, verse 1, it says, About that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Well, genius, obviously, God the Father is what you're talking about. Fortunately, he didn't respond like I do a lot. It says, Jesus called then a little child to himself. They're asking him a specific question. Who's the greatest in all of heaven? And he looks around and he, he calls a little kid. says, hey, come here. And you know that kid had to be like all kinds of giddy because everybody in the whole world wants to come and see Jesus. They're yelling out for him to just touch him so they can see him, so they can hear him, so they can walk and all this stuff, right? And then this little kid gets called up by the main show. And as he comes up, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. That is a weighty sentence, right? Because kids, they weren't really um, honored, so to say. They didn't have any kind of rights whatsoever in this culture. Their voices didn't matter, nothing like that. They were just, they just hadn't got to the place where they were worth something in, in most people's minds back then. And he says, unless you become like these little children, you're not even getting into heaven. Wow. Today, there are so many people that want to tell you you know, you're going to be fine. You, you're going to get into heaven. But if you really start breaking down Jesus' teachings, your heart better be in the right place or you're not getting into heaven. Not a whole lot of, of people these days seem to be teaching this. They seem to be teaching that, hey, you get into a relationship with God, you're going to have everything you want, whenever you want, however you want it. It's going to be the greatest, you know. It's, that's just simply not, not the case, you know. He says, so many, so anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. A child doesn't think they know everything. Well, it depends on their age. <laughs> a little child, little child, right? And yeah, let me let me repeat. <laughs> These little children, and anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf is welcoming me. Man, that's super important for us to understand. Because if you cause one of these little ones who trust in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to have a large millstone. Any millstone would work, but a large one tied around your neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Remember, this is Jesus speaking these words. If you cause a little one a little child that believes in me to sin, if you hurt a little child, that is very, very, very much so going to make their father God, Jesus, very angry. 
and it's going to be called a righteous anger. And it'd be better that you drowned quickly. Man. It goes on 7 through 10. It says, what sorrow awaits the world because it tempts people to sin. Temptation are inevitable. But what sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting? So if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better to enter life, eternal life, with only one hand or one foot than to be thrown into eternal fire with both of your hands and feet. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. And throw it away. It is better to enter into eternal life with only one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. Beware that you don't look down on any of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven their angels are always in the presence of my heavenly Father. We don't hear that last part very often, do we? I know... I haven't heard a whole lot of teachings on that. But he says, I'll, I'll repeat the last sentence. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels, their spirits are always in the presence of my heavenly Father. These people that you find not important, these people that you don't even want to take care of because it's inconvenient for you. It's so important to me. He says, and he says, beware that you don't look down on them. That's a strong word. Jeremiah 4 through 11. But don't be fooled by those who promise you safety simply because the Lord's temple is here. They chant, the Lord's temple is here. The Lord's temple is here. But I will be merciful only if you stop your evil thoughts and deeds and start treating each other with justice. Only if you stop exploiting foreigners, orphans, and widows. Only if you stop your murdering. And only if you stop harming yourselves by worshiping idols. Then I will let you stay in this land that I gave you to your ancestors to keep forever. But don't be fooled into thinking that you will never suffer because the temple is here. It's a lie. Do you really think that you can steal, murder, commit adultery, lie, burn incense to Baal and all those other new gods of yours, and then come here and stand before me in my temple and chant, we are safe, only to go right back to all those evil things again? Don't you yourselves admit that this temple, which bears my name, has become a den of thieves? Surely, I see all the evil going on here. I, the Lord, have spoken. That's kind of a strong word, isn't it? Do you really think that you can keep doing this? And not have any consequences? Ridiculous. God says it's ridiculous to think that. Because you're in my, my temple. You're not going to have to suffer consequences for these things. That's ridiculous. Kind of lighten the topic a little bit. My dog says, please. <laughs> Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And a shepherd leads, right? He guides, he directs. And he's the good shepherd. And is he not able to protect us from the evil one? A good shepherd isn't just there to watch over the sheep. A higher hand doesn't care about the sheep. And whenever a wolf or a predator comes in to try to get them, the higher hand leaves because they don't want to get bit. 
They don't want to have to tangle with a potentially deadly animal. But the good shepherd protects. The good shepherd takes care of, protects, mends our wounds whenever we need it, cleans us. Jesus talks about leaving the 99 to go after the one that goes astray. I've been the one that's gone astray. I've experienced him coming after me and pulling me out of a, out of a ditch or a vein or a whatever that I, I couldn't get out of myself. I've experienced it. You've all probably experienced it in some form or fashion. But he leaves the 99, not that he doesn't know you're still protected. He leaves the 99 to go find that one. You know, King David writes, he says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So the shepherd's rod and the staff, if, if Jesus is the good shepherd, God's our heavenly father, Jesus is the good shepherd, and, and he's got a staff and a rod. They're to do different things, right? It has, a, it has a hook on it, so that if that one is wandering away or almost ready to fall off, he can take it, hook him around the neck, and pull him right back in. But it's also, it's to protect them. It's also to lead them. So if you ever watch shepherds, they're walking behind the flock and they just kind of tap on one side. If he wants them to go this way, tap on the other side and the whole, the whole flock is kind of going this way, right? He's leading that way, but he also has to correct. King David says that your rod and your staff, they both comfort me. One of those is used primarily for discipline. Discipline doesn't seem comfortable, right? But it hurts way less than going down the path of destruction that you're on. And David knew that very well at this point. So they lead, they guide, they direct, and they correct. Did you know that the Bible says that the Father corrects those he loves? He disciplines those he loves. And he says that if a father doesn't discipline their child, that he, he hates them. If he didn't correct us and he didn't discipline us whenever we're going off course, basically he's saying, well, then that would be like me hating. And I know kids don't like to be disciplined. I don't like to be disciplined. I'm not a kid. Sometimes I act like a kid. My wife would uh, vouch for that. But nobody really likes to be disciplined. I'm telling you. Whenever he does it, he does it right. He doesn't do it wrong. He doesn't overdo it. Like we sometimes have a, a tendency of doing. He doesn't overdo it, but he does it just right. And it hurts. Don't get me wrong. It hurts. But it's supposed to hurt. You know that Philippians 4.13 tells us that we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. That even whenever we feel like things are impossible and we're going down a path that just seems absolutely impossible, that we can do all things, even overcome those things, because Christ is the one that gives us the strength to do it. That's good news. That's super good news. You know, we as the um, quote-unquote leadership of the church, we've been talking a lot about and having a lot of discussions about what is the church really supposed to look like. We brought it up during Bibles and Brunch. We've really been like, we, we want to do things right. We want to do things the way God has called us to do things and the way that he set it up in his word to do things. And, and we do the best uh, with what we have as far as our knowledge and understanding. But guys, whenever we get to a place where, you know what, we can do things better, we can do things more in line with the Word, then, then we need to be willing to be fluid, flexible, you know, and allow Him to make adjustments. Like in the military, if, if the infantry is out, and you know, these guys are up in the front lines, they're fighting head on, and, and they need support, and they call back to the big guns, and they're they're having 
send in mortars and, and shelling the enemy, if they're not hitting it right, they call in to adjust and fire for effect. So that I means, hey, the way you were set up before, maybe it was working, but things moved. Now you need to adjust that and fire for effect so you can continue to accomplish um, accomplish the task that God has for us. And we want to make sure that we're doing that. I'm not saying, hey, there's a big change coming, but I am saying that uh, we've always told you that, that we completely believe in the fivefold ministry. Right? And that's um, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. We believe in that. And we believe that everyone in the church falls into some of that. And everyone in the church should be walking out in their, their gifts, their callings, their strength. And so, as we go along, if we want to truly impact our area of influence and the world for the kingdom of God, the way that he's called us to do it, then we really need to be following his models of, of how to do things. So I want to kind of give you a brief description of each of these fivefold, and I want you to think about where do I fall in this? Like what, what do I feel like that God has called me to do? And I'm not saying that what you fall into is something that maybe you want to do, that you desire to do. <laughs> Please don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm saying what you feel like God has called you to, because a lot of times God doesn't call us to do the things that we're really good at, that we think we're good at, we're successful at, because if we do those things, then we're walking out in our own strength and in our own abilities. And then God doesn't get the glory, does he? Keep that in mind whenever I'm reading these off. So, apostles, I'll, I'll give you like a brief description. An apostle is a delegate, so somebody that's delegated, um, somebody that's been sent uh, to represent. An apostle is like an ambassador or a messenger, so the apostles were sent out, right, to represent God and to build the church. I like missionaries, to an extent. Prophets. Prophets are gifted to carry the words of God to the people, cast vision, and correct uh, and corrects course. So it's almost like a lot of times they have this direct connection, you know, to the word of God, to, to his voice and what he's saying for that time. Now, if somebody calls themselves a prophet, that doesn't mean that they're always going to be right. And the word of God clearly shows that. You know, a lot of times they take things into their own their own hands and say things that didn't come from God. So we have to test those things as well. Then we have evangelists. An evangelist imparts a burden for those who are not yet in relationship with God and his people. They're gifted to preach and witness and are strong in, in an outreach and ministry. A lot of times they don't know that though because they haven't done it. Pastors. So pastors... Notice that pastors aren't the first one on the list. I think that's for a reason. Um, pastors and also elders and deacons fall into this as well, I believe. And they're in charge of like the pastoral ministry, which involves leading, nurturing, feeding, and protecting the flock. And then you have teachers. They're good at digging out the truth and presenting it in an understandable way. Teachers might not be pastors. Pastors might not be teachers. All of these are different uh, aspects of the fivefold ministry. So I really want you guys to be thinking about those things. And, you know, these, these gifts aren't, they're not in competition with each other. These, these callings, they, they're not in competition, but they really should be expressed in every single congregation. These are, are a set of ministry functions or job descriptions, not titles. And I think the titles go to people's heads a lot. You know, it's easy to do. Oh, well, I'm this in the church. I'm this in the church. This is a job description. And job description means you work. That's what it means. You work. 
But the purpose of all of these is to train and equip and prepare believers to have a deep, personal, and intimate relationship with God. And to be able to function effectively and appropriately in everyday life as ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the whole purpose of the fivefold ministry. So, as we go out through our week, I want you guys to be thinking about those things. And praying and asking God, God, what is my role? And, and how can we, as Church on the Rock, on the right, how can we properly implement all of this? How can we find our roles in all of this to effectively impact the world around us? All of us should be doing one of these. All of us. So I know that today's message was a lot of it was kind of heavy, but it also doesn't have to be heavy. It also can be a message of hope. It can be a message of, of uh, knowledge and understanding and progress, a message of moving forward, the way that God wants us to move forward, how he wants us to move forward. And I know I just scratched the surface on several different things, but that's how we get started. You know, that's how we, we get the ball rolling and we keep the ball rolling. So, um, if you guys feel like, hey, you know, I feel like that God said this. I feel like God's calling me into this area, or God's moving like this and wants me to do this, whatever. Let us know. We're really excited of about moving the kingdom forward with you. All right. Well, we're gonna wrap up. We are going to end with a song. Um, just kind of a time of worship to remember uh, remember God but you know what speaking of songs that reminds me whenever we're talking about religion you know and this is this is what God views as religion I love the uh, the song we sang where it says shake up the ground of all my traditions and break down the walls of all my religion the reason I love that is because I do feel like that we can, we can get a skewed view of what religion is, you know? And we think that it's doing all these things and looking this way, and God says this is what it really is. So I'll, I, I love that in that part. It doesn't mean that we're throwing out uh, everything that we do, our, you know, the traditions and all that stuff. That's not what, it, what it's saying at all. But then it brings up, this is my surrender. And guys, ultimately, to please him, we are going to have to surrender ourselves our own needs, wants, and desires, and let him take care of us. But then we also have to walk out what he's calling us to. So we're going to close up with the song. If you guys have any um, prayer requests, any kind of needs, anything, you can come up here, find one of us. If, if you don't want to come up here, you can holler at us, and we'll come back to you. But um, we love you guys very much. We thank you for coming, and uh, be blessed.